Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, welcome to the Devolution for the Powers Committee. It's our fifth meeting. Um, as usual, can just make sure that our phones are put into the appropriate mode um, for the purposes of the meeting. Um, we don't have any apologies, but I know that Linda Fabiani is attending another event at the moment and will join us in due course. Um, first item on the agenda is an item, item, item one, is to agree item three in private. Um, and all future agenda items of its kind in private. Uh, for the first time, we've got a, an advisor with us today, um, and obviously we'll have an opportunity after the meeting to discuss the evidence we have. So I'm suggesting that that discussion is taken in private, and in future we do similar, so we can have a bit of a summary of that. Is anyone content with that? Thank you very much. In that case, we'll now reach agenda item three, which is... Uh, sorry, agenda item two, uh, which is evidence from some experts in the welfare field on the draft clauses, and I'll just quickly introduce the panel. Um, we have John Dickey, who's the Director of the Child Poverty Action Group in Scotland, Richard Gass, who's a member of the Policy and Standards Committee of the Rights Advice Scotland, Professor Paul Spicker from Robert Gordon University, David Ogilvie, the Head of Policy and Public Affairs at the Chartered Institute of Housing, and Jim McCormack, who's a member of the Social Security Advisory Committee. Um, who Duncan and I met with recently. And a very interesting discussion we had too. Um, just to summarise the, the, the session this morning, obviously we've got five witnesses in, in an area which can be quite complex and detailed. So I need to ask both my colleagues and our witnesses, and, and thanks for joining us for this, to be as succinct as we can. Otherwise I'm going to have difficulty getting through all the evidence session that we need to do. We're going to try and finish at the latest, about 11 o'clock. Um, and if we can keep it as tight as we can, then that will help. I know it's not always easy with given the subject matter, but we'll need to do what we can. Um, I think the best thing I can do is kick off the session, gentlemen, with a, a very general question. We've now all had the chance, obviously, to see the detail of the UK government's draft clauses on the welfare and command paper. Um, and I'd just like to get an overview from you. Uh, on how they're drafted uh, and the practical challenges ahead in terms of implementation of the new powers. So I don't know if to start off succinctly given this. I know that's a big question in many ways, but who'd like to kick off? John, you're looking interested at that end. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> it's interesting. I mean, I suppose our, our con just, to, just to kick off saying our concern is how Social Security powers can be used to um, prevent... Uh, child poverty and the wider inequalities that underpin that poverty. So wherever those powers lie, how those powers can be used. Um, obviously concerned in terms of any devolution package, how that package um, is delivered can have a, a huge impact in terms of the efficiency and the effectiveness of getting financial support to individuals and families, um, as well as obviously having a, a, how, how those powers might be used. Um, I don't think there's any question from our mind that the, um, the, 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 the clauses interpret the um, Smith recommendations uh, pretty narrowly <laughs> um, and some of the opportunities that we thought uh, had been, um, that, that did come flow from the Smith recommendations, for example, around the um, possibility of creating new benefits in Scotland, the possibilities around topping up benefits, the clauses don't give effect to those recommendations in a way as, that we, and I think was, was widely understood um, from the Smith recommendations. Um, I think the other key thing is, you know, the bulk of social security powers still still lie at UK level, which is important for us uh, in terms of how do we influence policy around social security. Having said that, very real opportunities in the in the, in the in, in, in the powers proposed for devolution and, and in the clauses, um, even as they're drafted, um, to improve the delivery of universal credit, um, to improve levels of, of housing support potentially, um, given the devolution of uh, uh, um, the, the housing element of universal credit, potential around support with maternity costs, um, potential around improving the adequacy. Um, and access to disability and carers' benefits. So, so real opportunities there. But I think what we're keen to, 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 and I think what you're looking to, to, to draw out today, is um, it's really important how, 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 the, how these clauses are given effect and how that's done uh, in such a way to minimise um, the creation of any new, um, uh, minimise the impact of creating new administrative interfaces that claimants might fall between. Um, 
to ensure that we have a system that allows for delivery of minimum standards of social security payments in Scotland, um, that, uh, that there's adequate accountability around that, um, and adequate oversight, uh, uh, opportunities for, for claimants to uh, appeal, um, that we ensure that there's no loss of uh, passporting arrangements, so when I mean that, wh wh where um, replacement benefits are created under devolution, that we ensure that uh, claimants in Scotland are able to continue to uh, be passported and access the reserved benefits that uh, they, they, they would currently be uh, um, passported to. And I think the final key issue for us really is to ensure that we, um, through this process, protect the role of cash benefits uh, in meeting particularly the extra costs of disability and protect them as a, as a social security entitlement. So there's real opportunities in here, but there are some, some, some real risks in terms of making sure that we get the, the process right uh, and get the package right in such a way that means that we improve the potential of our social security system to tackle poverty uh, and, and don't create any unnecessary uh, and, and, and new um, holes that claimants can, can fall through. Okay, John, you've given us quite a good overview there because that's quite a breadth you've covered. Has uh, anyone like to have ad added any supplementary into that in terms of the issues that were raised? Or are these the issues that you think were all there or other things we need to consider? Richard? A, a major concern going forward is going to be the, the, the level of money that comes over. Uh, and is that going to be sufficient? Because it's fine having new powers to deliver an expanse of, of benefits. However, if the finances don't match that, then what might be an opportunity today over time can become perhaps a, a problem for either Scottish Government or for the, the delivery agents. Helpful. John, Jim? So, so just, a, just a thought about kind of accountability issues. I mean, Smith observed that we have a uh, weak intergovernmental working. Um, uh, that's a problem. That's not an ideal context for welfare devolution, actually. And uh, the draft clauses respond some way towards that, but I've just observed that, that we've, we've got in the draft clauses an explicit reference to concurrent powers around universal credit, which puts us into formally a very different place in terms of how governments and therefore parliaments will need to work together. Um, and we're used to thinking in terms of reserve devolved splits, but there are shared areas in here now. And we need to think now, I think, think start thinking ahead about appropriate oversight, scrutiny, transparency arrangements. So whatever comes out of these revised clauses, we have much better machinery for independent oversight and parliamentary oversight. OK. Paul, David. Okay. In terms of the housing profession, which is uh, what this charge of housing in Scotland is here to represent, I think um, there are, much as other people already said, there are several opportunities here. Uh, we're not quite where we wanted to be in terms of what we submitted to the Smith Commission. Uh, I think we're a, a slight distance short of having a system where we were able to top up appropriately for the Scottish context. Um, there is a lot of interpretation in, involved in this process. Um, and in terms of how we are looking at the, the draft clauses, um, the recent debate over whether there was or wasn't a veto is something we really need to, to get some clarity on. Um, and also the, the how, um, how this additional funding that we would wish to bring in to support the most vulnerable in Scotland would actually manifest itself is an absolutely axiomatic matter. We're at a very interesting point, in, as we all know, in terms of politics, both north and south of the border. Um, we, we don't have that clarity until the other side of the general election, um, and we'll have to deal with things at that point. I think what I've tried to highlight in our most recent response, um, in the, the written evidence here, is our take is I don't think we've got much further forward in terms of um, getting the clarity we need. There has been a process. It's been a very rapid process, and, and anybody who, who's been involved with that um, should take some credit for that process, but I think we have not yet got clarity of very specific things around how we would afford um, to, for example, eliminate the bedroom tax, um, what are the opportunity costs that we're going to have to, have to face here in Scotland, and what would the implications be at a UK level. 
Um, and because the Chartered Institute of Housing is a UK organisation, we have a responsibility to make sure that we attend to this issue of no detriment. I'm sure we're getting, get, that's a very key point here, and, and how we interpret the issue of no detriment will be absolutely axiomatic. Yeah, I'm going to come, once we get this general opening section over, I was going to come directly into the no detriment area as one of the areas we need to cover. Paul? Well, there's a great deal that my colleagues have raised, which I think um, is, is it's important. And there is a shortfall in the powers that have been suggested within the draft clauses relative to what was undertaken in Smith, that there's a great deal of complexity. We begin from a position where all social security powers remain reserved unless there are specific exceptions. The way in which Smith has been translated into these clauses, has seen, in general terms, erosion at most points of the conditions under which transfers are possible and a limitation on certain powers, including some powers which the Scottish Parliament already has. Um, but I, I think beyond that, there is a a fundamental mistake in the process which has been undertaken by the Scotland office and by the drafters of these clauses. They've taken the view, I think, that their task was to ch alter the basis of the administrative responsibility for delivering certain existing benefits. So they have drafted a clause relating to disability which seems to them, although it's complex, to transfer responsibility for disability living allowance and attendance allowance. There are complexities within that. It doesn't quite do that, but that's the way that it's been seen. Now, that wasn't the task that they were supposed to be doing. This, these clauses, this draft legislation, does not create a single benefit. That is not what this legislation is supposed to be about. It's supposed to be about the transfer of powers so that the Scottish Parliament can make decisions in the areas of benefit. Certain powers were promised. They, the, the white paper says that they're there, but they're not. There is no power to create new benefits in these areas because the criteria on which the benefits can be distributed are being specified in the legislation. There is no power to top up reserved benefits, which again was in the powers. All that there is, and it's being passed off as if it was that, is a discretionary power to deliver short-term benefits in cases of immediate need, a power which the Scottish Parliament already has as a result of an order relating to the discretionary social fund. So we're actually seeing a considerable shortfall, but the shortfall reflects, I think, a problem in the approach taken by the clauses. Whatever we do, it's going to be difficult to implement this material in practice. There are going to be political problems, financial obstacles, but what I'm seeing here are legal obstacles, which may mean that a lot of initiatives fail at the first hurdle. OK, Jim, you laid out quite a, a map for us to try to guide ourselves through for the, for the next couple of hours. So I said we'd start off with no detriment area as, a sort of, as we begin to get into the meat. I think that's what we should do now. I think it was Stuart McMillan who identified himself as wanting to begin to yeah. explore that area. Okay. Thank you, convener. Good morning, panel. Um, I read the submissions with great interest and certainly what I've heard this morning um, it obviously very much backs up what, uh, what I've read, but uh, I'm still a bit, un a bit unclear in terms of the whole issue of the no detriment. Uh, I fully, uh, the Smith uh, report is very clear uh, in, in terms of what it actually is, what it's supposed to mean. Uh, draft clauses are a bit uh, less so, and certainly what I've heard this morning uh, really kind of highlights that as well. Uh, in terms of the no detriment, how workable um, are these clauses uh, that uh, have been produced? How workable to ensure that uh, there is no detriment to either uh, either Scotland or elsewhere within the UK? But also, um, I think that Mr Dickey, in your submission, uh, you highlight the point of no detriment to claimants. Would you just answer that question? Would you just tell us what you think no detriment means as well? Because there's different definitions of what no detriment is in that exercise. That would be helpful to us. I think in, in, in the Smith Commission, the, the 
terminal detriment was to mean that uh, neither the Scottish Parliament nor Westminster would be worse off by the transfer of particular benefit. However, you know, no detriment, I think, should be taken uh, a step further uh, to include no detriment to, to the individual, which will then uh, create a challenge for, for the Scottish Parliament Scottish Government in that any change would need to be better than what were there before uh, to ensure there was no detriment. At present, well, the, the powers are being considered and transferred. The, the, the government is firing ahead with the, the, the migration or the reassessment of folk on disability living allowance to personal independence payments. And this was a proposal from, from the Westminster government as a, a cost saving exercise. So what's happening while we're considering the matter is that benefits are being revised with a, an ultimate aim to reduce the social security budget on that particular area. And the question would then be, at what stage do we uh, measure the amount of money to transfer over? Is it at this point in time, or is it at the point when the, 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 the new benefit or the, the power would transfer? I suspect it will be the latter. It will be when the benefit transfers, by which point the budget could be significantly less than it is at present. OK. Paul? Well. Um, there are two no detriment principles in Smith. The first is about the generic transfer of powers, where I think it's relatively uncontroversial. The second part, however, is that in relation to each and every policy decision that is made, that there will be a cost or price attached. And the illustrations given in the command paper include costs, for example, to universal credit of any alteration in the tax rate, it, they include the effect on vehicle excise duty of passporting benefits. They include certain things related to employment programs. So I think we're actually talking here about a great level of detail where virtually any policy decision will be subject to a cost review. The area which immediately struck me in that capacity was universal credit. We don't know exactly what what it would cost to alter universal credit. But we do know something about the costs of universal credit now. According to the Cabinet Office, the estimated costs of administering and introducing an IT system for universal credit currently stand, 2021, at the staggering figure of 12.845 million, sorry, billion pounds. Uh, an absolutely staggering figure which indicates that a lot of the expense of universal credit is still to come. I was at a conference on Tuesday and was able to take advantage of the presence of James Wolfe, who is Deputy Director of Universal Credit, to ask what he thought the cost implications might be of different, um, different potential changes to universal credit. His answer was that some of them are already built into the system and therefore sh it should be possible to do it at relatively small costs. Uh, he gave the example of moving, for example, to buy monthly payment where the flexibility is already there and therefore it wouldn't require a major computer iteration. But he suggested that if what the Scottish government wished to do was to go for a more substantial or complex variation, for example, front-loading payments in some directions or moving towards an irregular frequency for other, for, for other reasons, that those could prove to be extremely costly. Okay. Anybody else want to reflect on that? Jim? So, so just to pick up on, on how no detriment is uh, treated in relation to employment programmes, there, there's a really important issue underlying here around incentives. So if a future Scottish work programme or work choices variation on what we've got at the moment were to invest in a different way, for example, in investing more in training, more in childcare, more of, of a kind of social investment cycle, um, and it takes longer to get your payback, but the payback is bigger, then it's very important that we understand the relationship between the policy choices made in Scotland and the actual outcomes rather than the apparent short-term outcomes. And th there are some clauses in here, 2.4, 16, 17, which talk about the need for a shared understanding of the evidence. Um, which sounds like a kind of technical point, but actually it's going to, I, I suspect it's going to be extremely important in working through what do we mean by no detriment, uh, where's the incentive for Scotland to invest more or differently in order to get a better payback, and um, 
we're only in the foothills of even understanding what shared understanding means about the relationship between policy choices and outcomes. And I suspect quite quickly we need to have some work through examples of what these might mean in future. Employment programmes, universal credit are two of the examples that jump out immediately from the draft clauses. Can I just ask a supplementary on that issue, Jim? Because obviously shared understanding would be a fantastic place to reach and that will not be an easy task. But there will still be disagreements inevitably. So if, if there are disagreements, how will they be resolved? Who will arbitrate and who will decide on the cost or, the, uh, or whether detriment exists? Have, have you got any views about how that might be best done? Because I, I, I guess that's going to be, that, that won't be part of clauses because that sort of material couldn't be. Yeah. But it, memorandums of understanding, agreements will need to be built up that allow that sort of architecture to arrive. So um, last week, as I understand, it was the first meeting of the Joint Ministerial Working Group on Welfare. Um, so there's clearly a bilateral Scotland-UK government angle to this. There will also be what Smith calls a quadrilateral element, which is the four nations of the UK um, and a wider future funding settlement. Um, I, I think that there will inevitably need to be kind of last resort um, uh, uh, ways of uh, resolving tension and conflict. There will be a need for appeals ultimately, but the best way in the interim will be, I think, to work through what this could mean in practice in you know, half a dozen key areas where powers are either being wholly devolved or there's an administrative power coming, so there's a concurrent power shared. Um, and, and we need both governments and parliaments to be working through those examples early so that we have a clear sense of where we might be going if different choices are made. It ultimately comes down to where the costs and benefits of different choices lie. And even if the evidence is contested in the future, we will need to have robust procedures in place uh, and do some of that design in advance. Okay. Does that then take us back to your original and very important point of the intergovernmental working and models that are out there? Because, I mean, as a broad general principle, no detriment they wouldn't be acting willfully to cause a problem here uh, or there, um, if that makes sense. Um, the, there are models, though. There's none of this insurmountable, is there? I mean, there are models in federal setups and others, and so we've had some evidence, well, I don't know what was presented this evidence or not from the Canadians, where they describe a whole series uh, of, 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 of mechanisms that they have in place, intergovernmental uh, 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 councils of ministers, etc., etc., where they actually see through all of these... Uh, uh, the, these uh, important disputes or, or, or discussions. So there's none insurmountable, is there? Uh, you, you have an expert advisor, I suspect, um, will be the best place of all to comment on this. But, but just to say, yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, we are, we're moving towards, you know, what outsiders might call a quasi-federal system. It's very asymmetric. And uh, we need to, you know, take the next step in, in maturing this settlement, um, which needs not just more formal mechanisms but needs much better day-to-day -day relationships between governments mm, and parliaments absolutely. and uh, there will be evidence being published soon by different bodies on how this works for example in relation to employment programs in Canada and in Germany and other federal systems I'm sure there'll be evidence in other areas as well. Question whether we're talking in any sense here about a federal system, that a fed federation usually is understood as reserving powers to the lower body. Um, what we are seeing is asymmetric in a different direction where there is substantial power reserved to the UK government and in particular to the Treasury. In the case of Northern Ireland, there is currently a dispute about the fa a failure of the Assembly to pass a certain legislation that the Treasury and the DWP think they ought to pass. At present, they are being effectively charged for their failure to make deemed savings. The deemed savings include, for example, £105 million from personal independence payment, where I think it's questionable whether there are indeed 
any such savings to be made, but that has not stopped the deductions and the monthly charges being made relating to those presumed savings. If what we have is a situation where finance comes from the UK government and the UK government determines what the prospective budget will be, then they will be completely in a position to control how much is done and indeed what is done. Remember that Northern Ireland has, in legislative terms, full legislative authority over all its benefits. Is that, is that an argument against the block grant and, 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 and Barna? I mean, in other, other systems, they've got, they don't call it Barna, but they call it social transfer. Are you, are you, are, is that a challenge against that, that, that sort of system? How do you overcome that when, when you've got uh, the block grant and, and Barna and social transfer the, between the, 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 the centre and regions or countries? How do you... How do you address that problem? I think we would like to know as a committee, we could make some suggestions in our report. I, I, I have to put my hands up and confess, I haven't a clue how to do it. Well, uh, that's, it's, that's, that's quite beyond my expertise, and sort of I'm looking in the direction of your advisor, hoping perhaps that she could help me, but I, no, I, I genuinely don't know how to get around that particular problem. Thanks. OK, I'm going to Stuart for a supplementary because I think I'll have one in Tavish, I think, wants to come in as well. So. Yeah, thanks. Um, first of all, Mr McCormick, when you mentioned a few moments ago in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, policy areas uh, where it already has been an element of uh, devolution, um, I would suggest, uh, with respect, that uh, an example uh, of, uh, of welfare is not the same uh, as like, energy policy. Uh, welfare, uh, welfare policy uh, is, uh, is a lot more complicated. Well, certainly, what we've already heard this morning as well. It's a lot more complicated uh, as compared to energy policy. So, I, I accept that uh, that certainly uh, we can. Uh, the two governments uh, could certainly look at what's already uh, in operation, uh, but they couldn't uh, automatically transfer over uh, the, the the working arrangements. Um, into somewhere like, uh, uh, like the welfare policy. Uh, but uh, another uh, point I would like to highlight, though, is just it's in terms of the, uh, in terms of the, the, the cost. Uh, Professor Spicker, you mentioned uh, the, the, the cost of the IT system, the, the £12.84 uh, billion. Pounds. Um, and the introduction of any IT system, it's never easy, it's never cheap, uh, and invariably there tends to be uh, overruns uh, and with that type of, uh, with, with what, what has been suggested this morning and also what's actually in the draft clauses, um, how confident uh, would any of you in the panel actually feel in terms of the, um, with a new IT system uh, be, being rolled out and introduced, how confident would you actually feel that, uh, that actually there would be no detriment to Scotland and also to the population of Scotland as a consequence of this system? No confidence whatsoever. I think uh, the point being made is that government IT projects come in over budget and behind time scales. So I wouldn't have any confidence that a new IT system would ensure there was no detriment. I guess the key question would be there. Well, it wouldn't just be about because both governments are capable of having IT systems that run over cost. The key question there is how how transparent the system is for for um, procurement and then agreement about how that cost can be appropriately divided between either the UK government or the Scottish government. But that comes back to the stuff that Jim was talking about in terms of a uh, shared understanding of what's going on in any system for disagreement, I'm assuming. I'm seeing nods, so I'm taking that as a yes, and I'll go to Tavish. Thank you, Convener. I just wanted to go back to Mr Cormack's point on the joint um, arrangements that need to be uh, between governments, um, and most of these will be formalised after the election for obvious reasons. Um, Smith is very robust on this, and there was, and it's fair to say that John Swinney and Michael Moore knew this inside out, and therefore that's why Smith is so robust on this. But you also mentioned, I think in your earlier evidence, that there's already been, a, or maybe there is to be, a joint ministerial meeting on Social Security. You mentioned the Quad and so on and so forth. All these things are already happening, which I think is entirely positive and a good thing. There's no parliamentary scrutiny of that whatsoever, either by this place or, I know for a fact, either by Westminster either. Do you think there should be? Um, I, I think that 
you, you're right. Smith was very clear about looking at some arrangements that have been put in place for Scottish Rate of Income Tax and HMRC. Uh, it's very clear in the fiscal chapter about the need for both parliamentary and independent scrutiny, and there's no reason at all why that shouldn't transfer over to all the clauses, including mm. the Social Security yeah. clauses. Um, I think it. I mean, I think it's it's understandable uh, to pick up David's point why we're not going to see much in the way of further detail pre-election. Mm. But what's more concerning is um, that the clauses don't say more on the kind of arrangements or the kind of process we need to put in place to get towards much more robust scrutiny, pre-legislative, during legislation, and once we get into regulations being, being actually made in future. At the moment, the Social Security Advisory Committee has a remit uh, for DWP and DSD in Northern Ireland around regulations, um, secondary re regulations in the welfare and pensions, advice giving to ministers both asked for and proactively given and the power to, to do an independent work programme to look at areas of concern and um, our hope would be that both governments emerging from the joint ministerial group and welfare will actively wish to look at how that kind of arrangement through SAC or others mm. can be put in place to ensure both that Scottish parliamentary scrutiny is improved and the capacity outside Parliament is also improved. So would you, uh, thank you, so do you think that um, this committee could do a reasonable piece of work on looking at that parliamentary scrutiny part of the equation, which after all should naturally come to a parliamentary committee to consider? Uh, absolutely, and I think that the role of the presiding officer uh, generically in, in improving scrutiny is mentioned yeah. both in Smith and in the clauses. Um, it's not obvious what the time scale for that kind of work would be um, I, I would suggest that there's a bit more urgency required around getting that interparliamentary um, uh, uh, focus, uh, well, coming into sharper focus sooner rather than later. I think I think you've made an absolutely important point there. Thank you. The, the general strategy, though, as it relates to benefits, some benefits interact and are interdependent, and it becomes extremely difficult to make any alteration in those benefits without having consequential um, effects on other parts of the system. We see this very clearly in relation currently to housing benefit. It will be the case in relation to universal credit. It's a re it will quite potentially be the case in relation even to a presently existing benefits such as council tax reduction. However, not all benefits are like that. And if we actually look at most of the benefits which are foreseen within the clauses, many of those are non-contributory, standalone benefits which do not need to interact with others. And here there is scope for action. Providing benefits are not means-tested, you can give small or relatively small amounts of money without affecting other entitlements elsewhere. And all you need to negotiate effectively is the principle that these things are treated on a standalone basis. Now, there are some benefits you can do that with, there are some you can't. So it will not work for the discussions about housing costs that are currently being had. I think that's regrettable because I think we could have moved to a position where we did separate out elements of housing costs, but that's not on the current agenda. But the more we can do of that, the less reliant we are on really difficult, complex negotiations with unpredictable and uncertain outcomes for claimants. One area, of course, where there is a fair bit of interaction is your DLA and PIP and how that interacts with other benefits. So that will be, a, I would have thought, an area that would be potentially, if, if in Scotland there's doing something different compared to the rest of the UK, that the arrangements that Tavish was talking about and intergovernmental inter arrangements need to be pretty strong. I, th I think that's right. I mean, um, DLA <laughs> acts as a, a passport to, um, for example, ESA for students. Um, and, 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 um, so, so, so you, you could change the um, any replacement benefit in Scotland could mean potentially more people entitled to those benefits, uh, which would have an impact on the um, you, you know the, the, the potential passporting the, 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 to, to, to the to the still reserved 
um, benefit to ESA. So there are there are interactions there that would have cost consequences um, uh, for for reserved benefit expenditure, depending on um, what passporting arrangements. And we'd be wanting to protect those passporting arrangements so that people don't lose out uh, when they become entitled to the Scottish benefit. Uh, that they continue to have that as a as a, as a as a mechanism for accessing those benefits that are still reserved, but which um, provide important support for them. Okay, thanks, Roy. I think Rob, did I just catch you? Got something yeah. interesting. A preamble in this section, we have come up against the problem about the definition of disability and disabled person, as well as that of carer. Now, perhaps the answer is that the intergovernmental uh, you know, discussions about uh, things that we discussed earlier there uh, might be the appropriate mechanism for doing so. But is this a problem for the Scottish Parliament's legislative autonomy in the definitions uh, within the draft clauses as currently drafted? No, it's... Richard? Yes, I would, I'd say definitely. And if we take the, the definition of carer, it's described to exclude uh, full-time students or those in employment. Uh, so we're, we, we couldn't, for example, decide that we'd have a, a, a carer's allowance in Scotland that could be paid to folk who are in employment. With carer's allowance, there's a, a, an additional element to means-tested benefits, there's a carer's premium within uh, all, the, all the, the means-tested benefits and within universal credit. And if we were to introduce a, a more generous uh, carer's allowance in terms of eligibility criteria, then we could potentially increase the number of Scottish residents who would be entitled to extra universal credit, which is not really what the, the devolved powers were, were, are intending. On the other hand, if we didn't change the eligibility criteria but increased the rate at which the carer's, the carer's allowance was paid, then carer's allowance is treated as income for those other benefits. So increasing entitlement could have a clawback from the, the reserved benefits. The most effective way to avoid the risk of confusion over the terms uh, and you know, to avoid the situation where people are penalised in this way. We need to we need to have a, a relaxation on the, the unnecessary restriction on on the definition of carer, and then there need to be something introduced. Because Smith made the point that anything that the Scottish Parliament chose to introduce should be a, a net gain to the individual. And in order for that to happen, there would need to be some recognition from Westminster government that the additional elements that were put in place uh, were to be disregarded in terms of means testing. Yeah. You're quite right to draw attention to the difficulty of the particular clauses relating to disability. The clauses have two definitions of a disabled person in different places. Clause 16 is, I think, the one which presents the most worry because it's a homemade definition which will have unpredictable effects that we can't deal with. I think we need to be aware that in talking with many of the problems that Richard's um, referring to, that there will always be those issues when it comes to designing specific benefits. But this clause is not there to design a specific benefit. It's there to define the powers of the Scottish Parliament, and then from there, there will be scope to design a benefit or not. I'm rather concerned that the extremely strange definition that has been used of disability does not include certain groups that would have been, I think, fairly automatically included in others, such as people with terminal cancer, such as people with multiple sclerosis, such as people with fluctuating conditions, and so on and so forth. And that's very easy to deal with in legislative terms if we, they simply use the same phrase that there is in Clause 22, in, the, in Clause 16, that would be taken care of. So there's not, a, I think, a major problem about the drafting, but what is it that they've done with this particular clause? Why has it been done that way? And it seems to be that they have wished the current criteria for DLA and attendance allowance to be carried forward rather than to create the opportunity for the Scottish Parliament to define benefits within that area of responsibility, which was the declared intention. If that, yes. 
following on just well, let, let, let John come in first then I'll yep. let you come back Rob sorry just no, complete problem. that little section to agree with what Paul says there in terms of uh, the definitions of disability constraining the possibilities um, even, even more than that the clause as it's currently um, uh, framed um, restricts even it doesn't allow for the payment of a, a PIP DLA replacement in Scotland to those who are terminally ill um, if there's no current um, uh, impairment to their capability so whereas it, it took a, sec a separate section of the, uh, the Welfare Reform Act UK Welfare Reform Act to allow for payment of PIP DLA to, um, to, to, to terminally ill um, uh, claimants um, as it's currently uh, as, as the clauses are currently uh, framed, that, that, that capability is not here in, in, in Scotland to, to enable that. So there's, a, so there's actually a kind of a, a gap, a, a, very a, very, a very clear um, pr problem there that needs to be, needs to be resolved. Since you want to say something, am I right? It, it, it's possibly going a wee bit beyond the boundary of the precise clauses, but I think as a, as a principle it should concern us that we have these quite rigid definitions of you know, under 16 working age, retirement age, when so much of that is quite fluid. And one of the big problems in all welfare systems is, it, is the jagged edges that are experienced by claimants when they tran transition from one age category, for example, to another. It may be the case in future that a Scottish government and parliament would wish to um, smooth out some of those jagged edges, smooth out the transitions, for example, when children go into adult services and benefits um, and the definitions we've got here are more restrictive than we've seen perhaps in the past and so it should be a concern that that might clash with a potential future direction of travel which would be about smoothing and improving the experience for claimants especially as they move from one category to another. Convener, just to ask a substantive question about Clause 16, people in receipt of DLA PIP are often automatically entitled to a range of other benefits and tax credits, some of which will remain reserved. Um, will this interaction between devolved and reserved entitlements make it difficult in practice to design policy differently in Scotland, for example, to remove those jagged edges that Jim McCormick has just talked about? Jim, you want to kick that off? Give, give, give an example from maybe from the employment field. Maybe other colleagues could talk about disability. So, so as proposed, it strikes me that um, a revised work program uh, support, will support to help people at risk of long-term unemployment, disabled people, into work and to stay in work. As proposed, might give us a situation where future providers in Scotland, which may be third sector public se public service providers would be accountable to here for their financial performance and their programme performance, <coughs> but still have to apply a conditionality system and a sanctioned regime um, to those programmes. That creates not just um, problems for claimants, but it, it creates strange incentives for providers. It creates incentives for gaming and false reporting. And that's a particular jagged edge. Um, if we know one thing about the current social security system and the welfare reforms we've seen, it's that a tougher sanction system has caused um, a great deal of difficulty for some of the most vulnerable people in our society. And um, so that jagged edge around conditionality uh, is one that should be a particular cause for concern, I, su I suspect. Okay, just to bring this a bit of focus to the end of this bit of discussion, then I'll come to Alec Johnson and wider universal credit issues. Um, from my understanding of Smith, people for extra payments were made were expected to get a net gain. I think that's from what I've been hearing from the majority of the panel this morning. That's their understanding as well. It doesn't seem to me that these are in the clauses at the moment, that particular aspect. Do you think it needs to be in statutory footing? Because we'll need to come to some point at some stage of making some recommendations. So do you feel that should be in statute, that that's that effectively people expect a net gain? I don't know how difficult it would be to draw a statute like that, but... I think the difficulty with that is that if you can only increase benefits and you can't alter them, then you can't create money to do it, to do things differently in other respects. 
And there will be cases where, for example, um, the Scottish Parliament may want to review in the future the balance of funding between, on one side, personal care, self-directed support, and on the other, the payment of cash benefits, and may well reasonably decide that it wants that balance to be different, but you'd have bound yourself and prevented yourself from doing it. Okay. Your point. Lewis? Uh, very brief one. Now, clearly, some of this is complex to do in statute. The issue that was raised a moment ago around definitions of carer and definitions of disabled person are presumably ones that could be very easily amended in terms of the current clauses, uh, unless there are unforeseen consequential uh, effects that I'm, I can't see immediately. I don't, I don't know if that's uh, is that correct. That, that point I was going to make is that there some specific amendments that need to be made if we're not actually going to restrict and reduce um, the support available to claimants in Scotland, whether that's um, around the... Um, uh, well, another example we haven't talked about was the, 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 the way discretionary payments have been defined in the, the clauses or described in the clauses, um, where uh, we already have powers um, uh, uh, in, in relation to the Scottish Welfare Fund that enable the Scottish Welfare Fund to make payments. Um, the way the clause is defined in, the, in, in, in these clauses um, actually limits further on the basis on which those payments could be made where, uh, and limits them so that where... Um, people who have been sanctioned or have lost benefit through other um, issues around conduct, which could include somebody with a mental health problem not filling in a form or failing to respond, um, that their ability to access um, support through the Scottish Welfare Fund would be actually be more limited as a result of the way the clause is, 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 is defined here. So that needs to be um, revisited. So there are areas which, never mind providing additional support, need to be revisited to ensure that uh, the existing levels of support that are are available can be maintained. Anybody else want to pick up on that? We all support that, Richard. Just in terms of the definition of carer, at the most regular and substantial care, but not in full time employment or, or in education. At present, the government describes that as 35 hours a week. There'd be nothing to prevent uh, Scotland from describing 17 hours a week or indeed allowing carers' allowance to be paid to more than one person. Uh, the consequence of that, however, is that carers', carers allowance or entitlement to carers' allowance is a, a passport to an increased element of a reserve benefit, which yeah. brings us back to that process. That's good. Back to, we're back to the beginning of the process here, the detriment area. Alec? Thank you very much. Uh, we've touched on the issue of universal credit uh, a few times during the discussion already, and I wanted to poke about in the subject just a wee bit more. The, the first question I was going to ask is a fairly simple one, and that is we've had the initial rollout of universal credit within the pilot in Scotland uh, in Inverness. We're now progressing with that. Is there any evidence uh, so far to indicate uh, the degree of flexibility that may exist in delivery arrangements uh, within universal credit? experience of universal credit is that the numbers of claimants have been so small that there's nothing really to learn at this mm. stage. Uh, Inverness hasn't reported back to Rights Advice Scotland any particular problems, which would suggest to us that, that, that there's not major problems. We know there's not been very many referrals to the, the local authority for support to initiate the claim. But the, the, the initial rollout was for young, single claimants without children without housing costs, so they were the, it was the easy ones, and traditionally that's a, a client group that doesn't tend to come forward to advice services, mm -hmm. so that's kind of still early days for that. Richard has just said that it really is, for our, for our purposes, too early. The, the, the numbers are too small, so and the only major things we, we're really focusing on is the fact that it looks like the IT system that are operating in, the, in, in these pilots um, is actually not scalable at this, uh, this juncture. That's the latest information I had anyway. So if that's, uh, you know, that, that, that conjoins with the point that Paul made earlier about the significant costs of uh, setting up an IT system, whatever we get, we have to bear in mind that there's going to be a significant number of years here between now and when powers over this area are effectively um, finally devolved to this parliament. Uh, I would anticipate, unless there's a significant change in direction at the UK government level on this issue, that we will actually have a form of universal credit in, 
but it will be interesting to observe how quickly the rollout can actually proceed if indeed what's coming forward to us in terms of anecdotal information about the IT system proves to be the case. Um, we're not anticipating even from the first two tranches of rollout numbers to be that significant in Scotland, that, that, that significant um, presumptions could be made uh, about how, how the rollout's going to go. Jim? Are you so, so just to say, um, uh, this week, to, to coincide with next rollout of Universal Credit, uh, which we'll see, I think, in 10 local authorities in Scotland by the middle of June, um, DWP published its, well, the first analysis we've seen publicly about the impacts uh, being in four job centres in the northwest of England, so not Inverness, but the job centres which have been longest running for some claims on universal credit, and that showed uh, small, modest, positive uh, impacts, for example, claimants spending an extra day per month in paid employment, uh, a net um, increase of £10 a month in uh, take-home, sorry, in income. So small early signs of small net impact. I think what's interesting, your point about flexibility, is there is the provision currently for alternative payment arrangements. So um, claimants can at any point, uh, if they know that they can do this, can uh, uh, apply for a different payment arrangement, for example, in frequency or payment direct for the housing cost of the landlord. Um, this has been seen, I think, in some circumstances as a kind of very much a minority pursuit, as a kind of you know, last resort arrangement. Actually, what we know is if you take the lowest paid people in society, those earning below £10,000, up to half of them are paid more frequently than monthly, weekly or fortnightly. And 20% of workers overall are paid more frequently than monthly. So um, alternative payment arrangement flexibilities, I suspect, should be seen as a permanent feature of universal credit and something that will allow households to budget in the way that best suits them. And the principle of choice is really important alongside flexibility for payment arrangements, universal credit. Just to pick up on that, I think it's, it's important in terms of what's been devolved to Scotland uh, in Clause 21 in terms of devolved policy responsibility for how payments um, might be made. That the, the infrastructure, the, the, the universal credit system has in theory been designed to allow that anyway. So there shouldn't be huge issues in terms of applying a different policy approach to um, direct payments, payments to the main carer, um, more frequent payments um, in, uh, as a result of that. And I suppose the other thing is that there's no legislative barrier to UK and Scottish UK government agreeing to provide that flexibility on a more wide-ranging basis uh, e e even now. Um, so I think that's, that's an important point to, to note as well. The conversation that Paul Spicker had earlier in the week, uh, small variations may not have much of a cost, but substantial variations significant policy variations over time could have a, a, a very substantial cost in terms of delivery. The, yeah. I suppose just the, the infrastructure should be designed to allow that to happen anyway, so I'm, I, I, unless it's not clear to us why scaling that up would have huge additional um, costs or, or, or barriers to, to allowing that to happen. Mm -hmm. Looking specifically at the housing element uh, of universal credit, um, Many people who currently uh, get housing benefit are passported onto that benefit by virtue of entitlement to one of the other benefits which has been rolled up into universal credit. Uh, do you see that relationship as being a problem as we go forward? Um, there are some relationships which we, we um, outlined in our written evidence around tapers that which we would be concerned about. So if you are actually going to be isolating the universal, for the housing cost element of universal credit and dealing with that differently, um, I think we would, we would come at that from the point of view we would absolutely want to see an assurance that the tapers that are on, the improved tapers that are on offer on universal credit do not um, end up being um, withered away or, or, or made less advantageous to people on universal credit. So that's, that's part of the, the um, interrelationships that we'll need to look at between the Scottish devolved policy and universal credit implementation. That's, that's an absolutely key point we're going to have to look at. 
Well, the housing issue at, the, at this stage, Alex, I'll come back to you if you want. Some yeah, more. I was I was interested to explore that on the basis of the of what we've just <coughs> heard in relation to the housing element of universal credit going forward, given the obvious challenge of 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 how that's going to work. I'd be interested in the views of panel members on on how they envisage um, as, assuming a successful implementation of, of a, an arrangement where the housing element in Scotland is devolved, but not elsewhere in the UK, and how that then works with the uh, as part of, if you like, a larger benefit provision that's that's the same across the UK. I think the is to devolve the housing element, but more mm. allow the the Scottish Parliament to have control over topping up or allowing yep. a, a slightly higher amount. So maybe having more generous figures for non-debt reductions, maybe allowing an eligible rent that's, a, that's above the, the 30th percentile, perhaps uh, reflecting the, the bedroom tax. But that would still be part of universal credit and for which uh, the Smith proposal, as, as I read it, would be that the extra cost incurred there would then be uh, passed back to Scottish Parliament to meet. I mean, I, I'm, I, I guess I'm looking at clauses, and, and clause 19 seems to address the issue of discretionary housing payments in relation to, for example, the bedroom tax specifically. But clauses 20 and 21 addressing um, universal credit talk about the housing element more widely and, and imply at least the possibility of a different policy approach. I'm not sure if, if that's right. We would have on this issue, we've already put into written evidence, which is it's great to have the ability to, to top up or, or to um, uh, tailor your policy from the Scottish parliamentary perspective to uh, deal with issues such as the bedroom tax, but that we have to still recognise the fact that we're operating within uh, a limited budget, so the opportunity costs involved in executing that policy decision would be of significant concern not just to the CIH but the entire housing sector um, and we wouldn't you know the number of times I've come before various different committees here and been asked so what else would you cut then you know I, sh I sure as heck would not wish to see any further squeeze put on for example housing development subsidy because we need to increase housing supply yeah. um, so that, that's possibly even a false um, dichotomy but it's just one of those issues we want to test you know, test the water with here okay I just wanted to build on David's point and, and really make a, make a link to a different part of the clauses and the Smith Commission, which I think is important. And that's, in fact, Scotland Act 2012. You know, if we think 10, 20 years ahead, one objective in Scotland might be to do a better job than we've done in the past at controlling housing costs. And that's about expanding supply of affordable housing in all 10 years, actually, not just social housing. Um, in the interest of controlling the subsidy we have to do it ex ante through housing benefits. Now, if, for example, uh, additional borrowing powers and bond issuing powers coming to Scotland, if we prioritise the expansion of affordable housing supply, um, that gives us a different trajectory on long-term <coughs> housing costs that have to be picked up through welfare provision um, and could potentially put Scotland in a more affordable and sustainable place, um, which, compared to the UK as a whole, we are in, but to maintain that in future, making the links to other parts of the welfare, sorry, the, the Smith Agreement and the clauses, especially around capital expenditure, is quite an important linkage to make, I think. Mark, did I, did I catch, that, catch that right at the beginning when you came in? You were quite interested in the area that some of this is beginning to get into in terms of top-up expenditures, yeah. um, better support for individuals, because obviously... From a, from a number of the contributions that we've seen, <clears throat> there's a suggestion that we could improve things by either topping up or giving or helping in certain areas. Now they've all got costs. So how we deal with that is going to be the in interesting issue. Mark, am I right? Did you yeah, yeah, I mean, basically, um, I appreciate we're looking at the welfare clauses at present, but obviously there are interactions. Uh, and there's a question around coherence. And um, I wondered, from your perspective, looking at the uh, the suite of powers that are proposed through the draft clauses, whether you feel that there is the the sufficient financial flexibility that would allow for the Scottish government to take a different approach um, and to fund that different approach in some of these areas that are going to become the Scottish government's responsibility around welfare. And just be interested in your views on that. 
I would answer that in two ways there is insufficient flexibility. The first is that because of the general reservation of all benefits, that limits the capacity of the Scottish Government or the Scottish Parliament to think about different ways of subsidising the activity of individuals. It will only poss be possible within the terms of these clauses to offer um, benefits within the narrowly constrained framework that the clauses specifically allow for. So there's a, there is a, a clear difficulty there. It wouldn't be possible to do, for example, one of the things that uh, the Smith Commission had envisaged, which was allowing a deliberate supplement to a reserved benefit. This will not be possible with it within these arrangements. So that's one of the, the large restrictions about flexibility. The other thing um, to, to say about this is that while those powers do not exist, and in particular while there is no power to create new and alternative benefits functioning by different criteria, then again the Scottish Government is effectively included. We have here the, the rather strange position where the reservations under the Scotland Act lead to rather more restriction than is available to English local authorities through the power to promote welfare. Okay. Perhaps if I can expand the question slightly. So let's, let's, assume, uh, let's assume a best case scenario that, that some of the um, the issues that you've identified here, the very real issues that you've identified here, we are able to, uh, through amendment, um, get get this back to, you know, a, a more purified version, if you will, of what Smith appeared to be suggesting. So let's assume that happens. Even within that context, is there the sufficient financial muscle being uh, afforded to Scotland through the other powers that are coming, um, for example, tax raising? Uh, or, or, or income generating or, or, or wealth creating um, that would allow uh, a different approach to be taken. Uh, say, for example, the ability to create new benefits was provided as a result of amendment. Um, those benefits would need to be funded. Is there sufficient flexibility for the Scottish Government to be able to, to take the kind of decisions that would raise the kind of income that would allow it to make decisions in those areas? Or do we risk having the potential that we have powers that come to Scotland which are, fe are there but cannot effectively be used? I think it's a, it's, a, it's a reasonable concern to raise and one that we at the start of this process flagged up that uh, we need to be very careful about um, seeing welfare, social security in isolation and thinking control over those in itself will allow us to tackle some of the poverty and inequality issues that we have without having wider fiscal and economic powers. I think the reality is this package is fairly, um, you know, as we said, the bulk of social security powers will still remain uh, at, at Westminster, um, as will wider fiscal economic powers. Um, so I wouldn't want to move away that there are very real opportunities within what is being, however restricted they are, there are opportunities within the, the clauses, even as they are framed, to do things differently in Scotland. Um, and that, that, yes, that will pose real challenges for, you know, in terms of public support and political will to use those powers to, to make the investments, but um, being able to um, take a different approach to maternity expenses, uh, potentially improve the, the level of support available through a uh, replacement to maternity grant, uh, being able to restore uh, payments of maternity support to second and subsequent children. These are real ways we could put money uh, into the um, pockets of um, families here in Scotland um, that you know we're, we're, we're not able to do just now and I would hope that the Parliament um, would <laughs> look at ways of finding the resources uh, in order to, to take that approach to be able to make further progress on tackling child poverty. There's other areas where perhaps even uh, not just in terms of I mean, obviously we're keen to address the inadequacy of current benefit levels but there's also different approaches that could be taken to the uh, assessment of uh, how, how people are assessed for benefits, particularly thinking about the disability <coughs> benefits. Um, part of this is about the inadequacy of those benefits, but part of it is about the process at the moment for claiming those benefits. Is, um, so 
complicated at the moment, too, too often feels very demeaning, too often actually imposes, damages people's health and, 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 and holds them, adds a barrier to them. So looking at minimising where we require medical evidence, um, where, that's, you know, where there's clear medical evidence in place anyway about somebody's disability or ill health, that that's enough to uh, ensure that they're entitled to benefit. Um, eliminating assessment where there's chronic or degenerative conditions, so we're not requiring people to go through assessment processes where it's absolutely clear, long-standing degenerative chronic conditions that should just automatically entitle them to um, uh, whatever replaces PIP in a devolved context, and ensuring that we have adequately qualified peers, the people making those uh, assess undertaking those assessments and making those decisions have a real understanding of um, disabled people's uh, conditions uh, and, and are looking at it from, from their perspective. Those, those are things that can be done um, that would really improve uh, the quality of support available to people, um, not necessarily with huge additional costs. So I would hope that whilst we I think absolutely rightly this is a restrictive package the, the, the clauses interpret something that's a fairly limited package in the first place there are real opportunities within this to do things uh, differently and improve the levels of support for, for individuals and families in Scotland and an awful concept about what is possible but it seems to me that more ought to be possible and I'd like just to examine briefly to, to examine your initial premise, which is that the clauses could be amended. What is it that we would wish to see? It seems to me that it ought to be possible for a Scottish government or parliament within its areas of devolved responsibility to be able to say that it wishes to change the balance, for example, between housing subsidies and housing benefits, or that it should be possible to change the balance between the amounts it gives in relation to personal care and the benefits which are available for people on personal care. As it currently stands, I cannot see any way of doing this within the constraints of the clauses as they exist, and in negotiating new terms, it seems to me that those are fairly basic to the local local integration of services. Okay, uh, just one one final question from me, if if I may, and and that's around the welfare cap. Obviously, there's been a a, a cap applied uh, in terms of welfare spending. Um, how how do you see that interacting with the devolution of welfare powers, and in particular the the role the treasury might take? if there were, for example, decisions taken around um, additional benefits expenditure, which may affect the, the total benefit spend that is taking place? <coughs> the, the clauses don't touch the benefit cap. Smith's report mentioned that a benefit cap, there should be some variation to ensure that any extra money paid would uh, end up in the pocket of the person and not, not come off. But Unless I've missed something in the, the, the clauses, that, that doesn't seem to be there. So, so there is the potential, for example, that if uh, one, of the, one of the issues that's been highlighted to this committee previously is the potential for um, a, a, a decision taken in Scotland to impact on, for example, universal credit or other um, benefit entitlements. Um, there is the potential, therefore, that there could be uh, an interaction with the welfare cap which might lead the Treasury to take... Um, what, what could be described, but what have been described by Professor Heald in terms of tax uh, areas as retaliatory instruments or, or a veto, essentially, around some of those decisions? The, uh, the welfare cap is far more symbolic than substantive. There are very, very few people who have been affected nationally in the UK. There are fewer people who have been affected by it within Scotland. And if it was a question only of financial implications, they would not be difficult to bear simply because so few people are actually touched by this. Um, I, I will confess, I have actually now met one person in Scotland affected by the benefit cap, um, but there are not many of them around, and that is because it's based on a false premise, which is the, that, that benefits are extraordinarily generous. I'm afraid that the common experience of claimants is that benefits are anything but generous. I, I appreciate that, Mark. Paul, Paul, could you do us a favour here, I think, at this mm -hmm. stage? Explain the difference between the benefit cap and the welfare cap, because there is a difference. Um, sorry. 
Sorry, you were about to go there. I, 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 was, I was about to go there and say that I was referring more, I think that there, there is a cap that has been applied in terms of overall welfare spend as opposed to individual benefit entitlement, um, which is, which is where individual. I was going with that rather than the perhaps the individual uh, element, which for, for obvious reasons has received publicity in the sense that uh, it, it suits a certain agenda to suggest that there are people out there who are receiving thousands and thousands of pounds in benefit, whereas the, the more pressing issue for us, I feel, is the welfare cap, which is designed to limit overall welfare expenditure. The recommendations was that that should be, I'm trying to remember now back, that, uh, that, 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 that there should be flexibility there that would take account of any additional um, spend in Scotland so that the, the benefit cap wouldn't act to the detriment of in additional expenditure to support uh, individuals in Scotland. Um, but others may remember more clearly. I don't, that, that, that isn't then covered in the clauses, but um, is, is this linked back into the whole issue around no detriment as well? Uh, uh, Jim wants to contribute. So Sorry. Right. I've got my search and find That's function right. on the PDF version. <laughs> so I can tell you, um, clause 2.411 says, in relation to Welfare Cup, the UK government intends to ref remove welfare programmes devolved to the Scottish Parliament from the UK Welfare Cup so that the Secretary of State for Work and Pensions would not be accountable to Westminster for controlling Scottish Government spending on these devolved programmes. Mm -hmm. So that seems clear enough, um, uh, but that's in the fiscal settlement section rather than the welfare section. And when it comes to the benefits cap, it talks about <coughs> accepting the principle of offsetting and disregarding, but it also talks about looking at it on a case-by-case -case basis. So there are... I think there's a potentially a slipperiness in the language <laughs> as we move from a the AME welfare cap, which I think what you're talking about, Mark, as we go down into the welfare section and look at the uh, the benefits cap at the household level. And it's slightly different but, 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 also, but also as well, uh, the, the clause that you've just mentioned there, um, the, there is still the potential for an interaction between the benefits that would become the responsibility of the Scottish Government and the benefits that would remain a reserved competence. So there could be cross-border impact, which I'm not entirely sure that clause definitely deals with, because while the Secretary of State would not be responsible for decisions that were taken here, sure. if those decisions had a knock-on effect on, for example, uh, universal credit, um, that then does have an impact in terms of an area that the Secretary of State would have responsibility for. So there may need to be some bottoming out of exactly what that clause is, is talking Which about. Which all roads lead back to no detriment, I suspect, and that's couched currently so broadly that it's feasible that the kind of interaction with universal credit that we're talking about here would be precisely in that category and, and may be seen as a trigger for uh, some kind of transfer payment. Okay. It's possible. Alison, I think, has got a supplementary here. Now, I'm going to come, I think, to Stuart around discretionary payment area. Right. Alison? Yeah, sort of following on from um, my colleague Mark McDonald's questions about, about you know, possible amendments to the draft clauses, am I right in thinking that the, the major concerns are around the way in which the original recommendations have been written into the draft clauses um, rather than the original recommendations themselves? It seems that more is possible within the spirit of the draft of the recommendations than is now possible within the the writing of the draft clauses. Perhaps Professor Spicker might like to comment on that. Oh well, well yes, I would agree with that, that wholeheartedly. In terms of um, basically, there has been a process of translation, which is obviously necessary, but there's been a process of attrition as well, where certain powers seem to have been clawed back. In, the, in those cases, it's uncertain as to how far these are deliberate results of drafting or how far they are the results of um, awkward drafting. I'd point, for example, to the reservation in Clause 17.3 of loans. Now, currently, um, the Scottish Government has the power to make loans. Uh, Scottish Parliament has the power to make loans, sorry, um, that... Uh, it chose not to do so in relation to the Scottish Welfare Fund. They do nevertheless exist in relation to social work payments. The clause is rather awkwardly worded, and I'm not quite sure whether it 
does say what it seems to say, but it seems to imply that as loans will be an exception to the exception, that loans will be reserved and that therefore Scotland will lose a power it currently has. Now, th that it's always difficult to tell with these things. These things have to go through a legal process, they have to be arbitrated, they have to go through courts. But on the face of it, it looks as if um, this is a power that is being lost um, for no visible reason. And that's an example of how the translation, I think, can trip us up and take us off in the wrong direction. And there are several examples of this sort as we, as we run through each of the clauses. I think, for example, that, though I do not know, that winter fuel payment will not be possible under the clauses. Now, the white paper says that it will be possible, but they have removed the form of words which legitimated winter fuel payment. Is this deliberate? I cannot tell you. Is that actually the effect? Again, I can't say with any confidence. But I do think that there is this problem running all the way through the clauses that we have in front of us. Would you have any specific advice to us as a committee on how to you know, mitigate that, that narrowing impact that the, the written translation is having? I think that the ideal would be in many ways to get section, Schedule 5, Section F, the heading section, reworded altogether. Currently it begins by saying that benefits are all reserved. And that if what instead we got a list of benefits which were reserved, then that would remove many of the doubts. And that would be additional then to certain exceptions which it's necessary to have. But I think that while there is a starting legal presumption that Scotland is not able to do these things, then there will be initial legal barriers. Remember, too, that these are only about powers. These are not about benefits. And Scot there will still be the decisions to be taken in Parliament subsequently as to whether or not relevant benefits should then be brought in in the terms that are being proposed. I'm not seeing anybody else on that, so uh, you got a supplementary? Just, just to be clear, we talked earlier about areas where it was possible to make relatively straightforward amendments to clauses. What's being described there would be a fundamental rewriting of the entire section on welfare. Is that correct? For, by Paul Speaker. I, I'm sorry, could you reset the question? <clears throat> what you've just described in response to Alison Johnson was not a straightforward amendment to a particular clause. No. It was a complete rewriting of the entire section. Um, it's not necessarily a complete rewriting. It's a, it's, a sec it's a rewriting of the particular opening to Schedule 5F of the 1998 Act. But on which everything else depends. But, 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 uh, but everything else would be altered by such a rewriting. Okay. Okay. Specific clauses and specific restrictions that we could deal with. Um, you know, I'm not not making the case one or the other. We need, I, I think, some of the restrictions um, around, for example, uh, PIP for terminally ill, terminally ill, around discretionary payments um, under what's currently the Scottish Welfare Fund um, that could be amended fairly straightforwardly, so that we don't get a switch from require, you know, um, restricting um, uh, payments. Um, and I think clause 18, the new clause, the clause 18 would now require there to be an acceptable, a, 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 exceptional event or circumstance before a grant could be paid at the moment. Um, that re requires there to be a, a risk to well-being, but that's a, a, you know, it's a further restriction to, to require an ex exceptional event or circumstance. That could be changed and removed quite straightforwardly, so that at least we don't restrict further the, uh, the, the, the powers within the, 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 that are possible in the Scottish Welfare Fund. So there are things that can be done Quite. And it's perhaps important to recognise as well that there are examples of some changes being made in the opposite direction. In the case of universal credit, um, the Smith had proposed that there should be the power to alter the frequency of payments. What the draft clause actually suggests is a power to alter the timing of payments. Those are not equivalent. Timing is rather broader than frequency, and it could, for example, affect when the first payment was made, at least in principle. Okay. Jim? Just very briefly, to, to follow up on, uh, on Paul's point, uh, the Social Security Advisory Committee has recently uh, submitted to the Minister for Working Pensions 
our concerns, the results of our consultation on proposed waiting days within Universal Credit, which would have the effect of a five to six week delay before the first payment is actually made. Now, if, if, if what Paul has spotted um, gives an opportunity in Scotland, uh, which to say it isn't closed down at the draft, redrafting stage, to look at the timing of the first payment, in other words, to potentially alter waiting days, that would be of significant uh, material impact at the start of a universal credit claim. So it's just a, a point that Paul has very f helpfully and importantly flagged up. I think. So if we're rewriting all the clauses, we'd better hold on to that one then. Yes. <laughs> Perhaps. I've raised it. <laughs> uh, Stuart. Thanks, Kavina. Um, yeah, I wanted to take us back to, uh, John's referred to this a couple of times, Clause 18 in the discretionary payments area in particular. Um, the Smith Commission recommendation stated that new powers to make discretionary payments in any area of welfare was, in essence, the recommendation in Smith. And I'm just wondering, does the, the extension of the provision to make discretionary payments as set out um, in Clause 18 actually um, provide additional powers in this area or not? Paul, you seem to suggest not at the very, in your very opening uh, yeah. answer. I, I think not. I think that Clause 18 basically lays out powers which were included in a previous Section 32 order relative to the Social Fund, and it yes. does so in substantially the same wording um, with slight uh, loss of power in relative terms. I think that there is a confusion in the White Paper about what it means for a payment to be discretionary. A payment is discretionary is essentially if there is an administrative or governmental decision and it is not therefore subject to entitlements or rules which would limit it from being, um, from, from being made in the way that it is being made. I think they've taken discretion to refer only to individual discretion for short-term payments. That's a very special sort of benefit. Um, if uh, those with long memories may remember the Supplementary Benefits Commission, which delivered very extensive welfare provision on a discretionary, that is a non-entitled basis. When Smith said that Scotland should have discretionary powers, I was assuming it meant powers of those sort. Okay. Um, John? I think, I think that's how, how those, those powers were understood when reading this, widely understood when reading the, the Smith recommendations and the clauses don't clearly don't give give effect to that mm. that broader power to be able to uh, top up um, for example top up reserved benefits um, in, in Scotland okay I mean I, I wanted to ask or follow on about the the this definition of of what is um, discretionary because I read your paper uh, mr speaker and clearly um, what I would have assumed was discretionary is, as you've described there, effectively a decision could be taken which was out with entitlement, um, and you could decide, a, a, a ministers, whoever, could decide whether a, you know, it could be paid or not paid, as opposed to what seems to be um, specifically about short-term um, uh, payments in very specific circumstances. And John's paper, um, you mentioned earlier, unless the need result, results from an exceptional event or circumstances seems to be the very specific reasons that, that that payment should be made. Let's give a small example of why would a government introduce a discretionary payment mm. as a top-up to a reserve benefit. Think about the Christmas bonus. That's the sort of thing where you might say you don't want to make it an entitlement necessarily, you don't want to keep it going, but maybe it's something that a government may, at certain circumstances, wish to do. Is there a, is there a legal definition, though, of... Um, discretionary payments that only includes payment to meet a short-term need to avoid the risk to the well-being of an individual, as the UK command paper suggests. Is that an accepted definition? It, let's say, not, not, not within the, the literature that I'm aware of, the key definition of discretion, I think, tends in most of the literature to follow Casey Davis's um, work, Discretionary Justice, um, to argue that discretion refers to gaps or lacuna that there are in le systems of legal rules where effectively supplementary rules are then made. Um, and it's that rather than particular point. 
the, the particular point. But clearly, um, the, social, the Scottish Welfare Fund is a discretionary benefit of a, different, of a particular type. It is one example of discretion, but discretion can run much wider than that. Okay. Can, can I, uh, Kavira, um, come to the, the paper um, by the Chair of the Action Group, John, your paper, um, and ask you about, um, you obviously have concerns about the clause, um, I read it earlier, unless the need results from exceptional event or circumstances. Could you maybe explain further what you mean by what, what your concerns are in this area? I mean, the, the key issue is under the, under the current powers and the Scottish and, and the, the, the Scottish Welfare Fund operates under, it's possible for people to access um, uh, crisis grants, uh, for example, um, even if they've been sanctioned uh, and they've lost reserved UK benefits as a result of, of, of a sanction, um, as long as um, there is um, a risk to, to their well-being. It's not an automatic bar to them being able to access that support, and that's really important, because uh, in, in some cases people have been uh, sanctioned, left with no money, um, and the Scottish Welfare Fund has been a, a source of absolutely crucial uh, financial support to them. Um, what's happening here is it looks like the, you know, well, the, the, the clause... Um, restricts that further by saying there needs to be some kind of additional exceptional event or circumstance which clearly could um, act as a, um, you know, a bar to the, the, the scope within which Scottish Welfare Fund payments could be made if somebody has been um, sanctioned in, in relation to a UK benefit. But even further than that, not just in relation to um, having your benefit sanctioned, but it refers to um, losing benefits as a result of, 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 of the conduct, conduct uh, of, of the uh, claimant. Um, so that could be losing benefit because you failed to return a form um, or you filled in the form wrong. Um, clearly, people with uh, uh, mental health problems, learning difficulties, literacy issues, this sometimes happens, you lose your benefit because you've not... You know, and that could be described as, as conduct uh, for them then not to have access to um, Scottish Welfare Fund under the, the new um, powers in relation to discretionary payments would be uh, a serious... Um, blow in those situations. So, um, yeah, I mean, so that's, okay. uh, does that clarify, I suppose, what, what the, the restriction there, there but, is? But I would be inclined to say that almost any experienced welfare rights officer could drive a cart and horses through the phrases that, uh, that, that John's been talking about. I think that that's actually part of the problem, that this shouldn't be subject to legal arguments in particular contexts where it's uncertain for claimants and where it relies on backup and support. Um, we've seen what's happened with exceptional circumstances in the past. I can remember when um, we used to have to claim that it was an exceptional circumstance if you need more than, needed more than one bath a week. Um, that, was, that was within the rules. But um, having said that, the, 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 there's an experience where basically governments start off with inappropriate definitions and gradually those definitions are put under the hammer until they no longer have the same shape. We shouldn't be starting there. Sorry. Well, I think it's just important to make sure that we're certainly not doing anything that adds further restriction to um, the powers to provide um, discretionary payments under the Scottish Welfare Fund. Yeah, I mean, I, I think this is part of my confusion that, that Clause 18, and it, maybe I'm trying to be objective here, seems to take us a step back slightly yes, exactly. from where we currently are, um, rather than a step forward, which is, I think, our, our, my understanding of what Smith was trying to refer to. Um, in this area. Just one final question, Kira. Well, I, I, I saw people reacting to that, but that won't be on the record just because there's a reaction to it in terms of that more restrictive nature of the mm -hmm. clause you're talking about. So I could just ask somebody just to put on the record, I saw nodding heads there to what Stuart said, so we know. So we know. Yes, yeah, I think that's our understanding. Yeah. Can I get a wee bit of clarity? Because most of us around the table here, we, 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 we're dealing with language and uh, in an area which we don't normally deal with in our caseload, so we are behind the curve here. I'm, at this stage, unaware what the eligibility is. Although I know that people have to come to me and come to my colleagues that they can't get a crisis grant and because they haven't met that eligibility criteria. And it's not a matter of just walking in and getting it. So what's the substantive difference between the language that's been referred to by Stuart and the current eligibility criteria to get a crisis loan, say? At the moment, 
people need to demonstrate is that or there's, there's a risk to the well, their well-being if they don't if they're not able to access that. So that it's gravel. a simple risk, just... risk to their well-being, um, which I think is fairly broadly. You know, people can't buy any food or they're so unable what? to pay pay, pay, so pay their so electricity. Okay. To then add that there also has to have been some exceptional event or um, or circumstance over and above there being a risk to their well-being for not. That exceptional event could be a sanction. Well, this, this is actually about um, restricting um, entitlement where uh, eligibility, where a sanction has been imposed. Uh -huh. So, 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 so it's, it's an exceptional event and the, the issue of... It's where, where a sanction has been imposed. John, I'm just saying, lost, you don't have any money because of, uh -huh. of, a, of a sanction. None of us here want to make it any mm. tougher for people to get help yeah. in, in that crisis situation. But I want to know, in terms of the discussion we'll have after this, yes. about whether this is a substantive issue or whether it isn't. I think we would argue it's a substantive issue. I don't want to over, <laughs> overplay it in the scale of some of the other issues that we're discussing, but the language But this uh, could be a problem, or it might be a problem. Uh, as a, you know, I, I just don't is, get yeah, it. Abs it abs absolutely. Uh, the difference between um, being able to demonstrate a risk to well-being and the additional um, to, to be able to so require an exceptional, exceptional And a risk to well-being. So there's, there's a problem is in introducing new vocabulary in welfare rights because what the effect of any new vocabulary does is to create uncertainty uh -huh. about entitlement and to give us a period in which this has to be negotiated and argued. There is in fact a number of precedents about exceptionality. I can remember taking cases about whether it was when torn trousers were considered exceptional and when they were considered to be normal wear and tear. We really don't want to be going down this absolutely, road absolutely because for the claimants... Point. What I'm trying are, to get at, John, is, is this an area where the committee needs to seek more clarity or comes to a judgment as we were, we were, we were you know, momentarily ago coming to a judgment that this is a bad thing? When we don't know, and the clarity is not there. Well, I, that's you know, for our future discussion. Just to help move this on a little bit, I think what we're kind of getting to the point is clearly there is a perspective emerging here that the, 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 the framework that's been offered here, that's been arrived at through this negotiation process, seems to be, as you've already said, as others have already said, a step back. What we wish to see is a welfare system that supports a better working housing system from our, from our own perspective. I would have grave concerns about the impact of people in crisis, in, for example, in rural areas, and that's, that's where my mind's going to, who are unable to get access to a, a crisis payment and, and, and are left in you know destitute situation. But that's not a situation which supports a, a well-functioning housing system in, in, in any way. So given that the Scottish Parliament does already have powers to, to over housing in terms of housing policy, you need to have, therefore have the powers to support the housing system through uh, the, the benefit system. And this sounds to me like, although it wasn't one I have to admit that I'd spotted yet, it does sound to one that we need some further substantive clarification on. Thanks, Stuart. Yeah. And that's, that, that's what I was trying to go to, because it does seem to me that it looks like, on the face of it, that we've introduced or are in danger of introducing ad additional barriers. And, that's the, and, I, and I see all, for clarification, I see all the panel nodding. I think we're, we're in agreement and that's what's happening here. Um, but, and that does concern me, because I thought the Smith Commission's recommendations were pretty clear on this, but now the clauses now seem to have made it less clear. I just wanted one final question. And it takes me back to the original point and the quote I, I used from the Smith Commission um, recommendation about new powers to make discretionary payments in any area of welfare. Does Clause 18 meet the recommendation of the Smith Commission in this area to permit discretionary payments in any area of welfare? No. No, no I think that's universal agreement on that one. Okay, in which case, I'll go to Lewis. Thank you very much. Just uh, following up on the discretionary housing payments, and again, there are specifics within the clauses okay. in specific restrictions in terms of eligibility. I'm particularly interested from the housing uh, uh, provider perspective or the housing profession perspective, what, what those, those restrictions, for example, prevent the use of housing benefit to meet service charges, for example, that sort of thing, which clearly given... Um, people's care needs are, are, is, is quite a significant restriction. Are, the, are these unduly restrictive 
Um, do they reflect this, the, the intent as you, uh, of, of the Smith Commission and how will they work in practice? Well, with specific regards to eligibility criteria and what have you, I have to have to admit to you, I haven't got to the point where I'm, I've got a set line on that. We've right. some more work to be done sure. um, in a house to scope that. Um, so I'm, a bit, I'm kind of unable to answer that question, but what I would do is come back to, to this committee with, with written submission subsequently, if that's okay. That, that would be very helpful. Yep. Mm -hmm. so, well, thank you, David. I don't know if other, John, uh, John Dickey made that. Worth adding in that um, what the, the, the new clause does, it doesn't give power to enable local authorities to give discretionary housing payments to individuals who are not in receipt of housing benefit. Mm -hmm. And the way that uh, the under-occupancy charge of bedroom tax is applied at the moment, some um, claimants, particularly those who are in work, um, maybe receiving a, a relatively small amount of housing benefit, actually lose all that housing benefit, which then essentially means they're not entitled to a discretionary housing payment. Um, so, in effect, as it's currently... Um, um, as the clauses are currently phrased, um, we can actually um, fully mitigate the impact of the, the bedroom tax through discretionary housing payments because there'll be some people who um, are not entitled to discretionary housing payment uh, as a result of um, having lost all their housing benefit um, uh, as a result of the bedroom tax being applied. So again, something for the committee to be <laughs> aware of in terms of what's actually in effect um, enabled through these clauses. The way you've described it suggests we're talking about small sums for a small number of people, but presumably, a, a, again, a relatively straightforward thing to adjust in terms of the clauses as they draft. I would have thought so, because a small amount for a small number of people, but an important amount in terms for of those individuals. That, that absolutely. Area. Yeah. 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 Okay, well, Thanks. That's it. Linda, I think there was the area of employment support was the last area I think we were left to explore. Oh, so right, you, okay. you were interested. Yes, in there was a few things I was interested in in that. Um, in, Employment support in general, um, to quote from the Smith Agreement, uh, all powers over support for unemployed people provided through contracted employment programmes, the work programme as we call it. But it seems that in the draft clauses we have something very different. Um, it talks about persons who are at risk of long-term unemployment and, of course, disabled persons. But it talks about the assistance being for at least a year, and I just... First of all, uh, your view broadly on the difference between what was proposed in the Smith Agreement and what the draft clauses have come up with. Okay. Come on, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> Get that search facility going. I'm going to. So, um, I think w w what's interesting is that Smith talked about what we currently call the work programme, work choices. Those are not the only, but those are the main mm -hmm. programmes uh, for the clients we are, we are talking about. Um, and then w when you think about the possibility, well, we talked earlier, I think maybe before you arrived, Linda, about the jagged edge around conditionality. Yes, that, I that's came in at that point. W one aspect that I think does need to be... Um, Revisited the point about 12 months. I think anyone would understand the intent behind the requirement or the expectation that support would be available for at least 12 months. Um, but there are cases where people with the right kind of support, for example, pre employment training or childcare or transport support, can thrive in work without the support being there for a full 12 months. So although it seems an odd thing to say, I would want to see flexibility in that area mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to allow where progress, sufficient progress has been made and is agreed by the individual and the provider, mm -hmm. that support can be refocused on those who may need rather longer than 12 months. And we know that one problem, mm -hmm. problem with work program in particular is a very poor performance for uh, people with fluctuating conditions, some older people, some people in rural areas, um, where some of those people need longer support um, and that means more expensive support. And the context of you know being able to make different choices within fixed budgets, alternative choices can quickly become expensive and the flexibility to be able to move resources around these programmes strikes me as pretty important principle. Yeah, so that would tie in as well with 
know, this thought from Smith that there would be um, you know, powers given over programmes for the unemployed, generally. And now it seems to be in the draft clauses, it's only for the longer term programmes over a year, etc. Does anyone have the information to say how much this is restricting the original intention of Smith and what effect that could have? Like shorter term employment programmes, for example, the interaction between that and the rest of the system seems to me that it's going to be terribly piecemeal as to trying to have a cohesion and an overall picture of how we are dealing with services for the unemployed generally. Do you want to go, Paul? Well, uh, yeah. I, I don't have a clear picture of this, and I'm, uh -huh. I'm, I'm as puzzled by the clause as you are. But when I note that it includes skills training as well, then uh -huh. it seems to me that lots of skills training might be short term and the idea that there should be any restriction on skills training I find deeply puzzling I don't uh -huh. I don't understand um, why this res this restriction was thought appropriate but mm -hmm. once again I have to emphasize this is not a provision that is legislating for employment support it's a provision which is giving Scots the Scottish Parliament the power to make decisions and um, why restrict those decisions in this way? I cannot begin to fathom. Right, well, that, that moves on um, very well, actually, Paul, to the question I was going to ask about your paper in particular. Um, your Clause 26, you talk about the UK government retaining the ability to make mandatory referrals to the Scottish government programmes, and then you, you speculate, rather, about the implication of that uh, for the Scottish Government. I wonder if you'd like to expand Well, on I, I'll read what I said, which is, it seems to imply that the Scottish Government will have the duty to provide programmes in these terms and to meet the expense. Um, that if the, these are mandatory referrals and the UK Government retains the ability to make mandatory refer referrals to the programme, I don't think that the Scottish um, Parliament is being given the option to decline. Right. But uh, mm -hmm. I have not, that is not within the clauses, that is within the uh -huh. text of the white paper. Uh -huh. um, again, how it would operate, um, I think, takes us back to this business of intergovernment working. Uh, I am puzzled as to where they think the authority lies. Right. So that has to be explored. Something further in that, from the Child Poverty Act. Oh, yeah, sorry. Did no, I? no, sorry, right. apologies. Um, John, you said in your submission you were concerned about the, I think, the interplay between employment programmes and conditionality and sanctions. Yes, this was just to, to, to make the point that with work, you know, working age benefits and the current reserve, the current condition, conditionality and sanctions regime, which in many cases is... Um, actually undermining people's attempts to move mm -hmm. uh, into work and to, to move towards the labour market, uh, that will still be applying. So uh, I suppose it's the same point as Jim made, this, this jagged edge between mm -hmm. what we might want to try and do differently in Scotland with the devolved um, employment programmes coming up against um, the requirement that, that that that'll still be working within a, a reserved benefits um, regime, which too often um, is in Imposing uh, uh, arbitrary conditions or conditions that aren't actually helpful in terms of supporting people to move into work uh, and imposes mm -hmm. uh, damaging sanctions on them when they fail to do that. I think there, w there will be very real opportunities within, even as as it's uh, 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 as, as it's currently proposed, um, to do things differently to ensure that employment support in Scotland is more um, suited to the local labour market, more appropriate to what's actually available in terms of childcare support and other support to, to enable parents, for example, to move back into work um, that would he hopefully help to reduce the number of um, inappropriate um, or arbitrary kind of tasks that people are having to undertake take in order to meet the benefit requirements but there will, there'll be, there, there's going to be there's a limit to that because the actual the, the, the benefit regime will, 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 will be as it is now unless we manage to, to get the changes to that that we'd like to see. 
See, even before Jim comes back in, I'm also concerned about you've got the service providers of the work programme, to use the term. So you could have the work programmes, perhaps, unless we were uh, mandatorily told otherwise, the work programmes being run by the Scottish Government. So the service provider is being paid, if you like, by the Scottish Government, responsible to them. But then you have the sanctions regime coming from DWP. So there's an interaction issue. Uh, a responsibility issue here for the service provider. How would that work? The, well, the, there are there are um, conflicting incentives, which yeah. I suggested earlier will result in um, uh, gaming, false reporting, and so on. If we're not if we're not careful, I mean, I think broadly what what we have here has been has been said by <laughs> Paul and John is is a UK government retaining the power to mandate uh, unemployed people. Um, at certain point in their in their GSA claim um, or their ESA claim, um, uh, to then take part in Scottish government programmes. So there's quite a lot of space beyond that mandatory referral to design what kind of activity. The clauses talk about various techniques and tools that can be used. I think there, al although there are clear restrictions here, which could be. Uh, which could cause detriment both to claimants, participants and providers. Nonetheless, there's a space here, I think, in Scotland to uh, reframe conditionality. Conditionality is not and should never be simply about penalties and sanctions. They should also be about the, the incentives you can draw down by, uh, by taking part, by meeting that condition to participate. Mm -hmm. The incentives might be about better training, better childcare, transport support, and so on. If Scotland is investing in those kind of um, uh, ways to improve outcomes ultimately, then the incentives for doing so should be very clear. In other words, the savings for doing so should be very clear. That boundary is there, still there to be negotiated. Um, but I think it's really important that even within the terms of these clauses, I mean, DWP currently pilots all sorts of flexibilities across the UK, uh, not very often in Scotland. Um, there's no reason why there couldn't be um, a, a negotiation around more flexibility for Scotland in this space, uh, even within the important restrictions uh, imposed by these clauses. See, when, when you're talking about incentivising, uh, I'm certainly not an expert in this, but I understand that um, providers of the work programme get paid by results. So again, that interaction between the paying by results, which I presume is about getting people into work, by the person that's paying you, and the obligation to report to the DWP about, again, about the conditionality and sanctions regime. So seems on, to me very difficult. on the results side, um, I think we will have the Scottish Government and Parliament being responsible for design of these programmes, commissioning of these programmes, um, and then performance reporting and financial reporting. That gives some leverage to reshape the terms in which people take part, to reshape the terms in which providers mm -hmm. run activity in, in, in this space. Um, mm -hmm. You, one could one could draw this boundary in different ways, the split between re reserved and devolved powers. The clauses suggest a certain way of doing it. Um, a purely personal view, not an organisational view. I think what matters is coherence for the claimant and the provider. And so, um, ideally, we might have seen responsibility for Job Centre Plus functions as they apply to mandated claimants, oh, yeah. also being part of that accountability framework. That would be a quite modest shift, actually, because the bulk of expenditure in this area is not going for long-term unemployed claimants. It goes elsewhere. Um, uh, that may or may not be possible in the future, but ideally, coherence and smoothness for the participant and the right set of incentives for the provider should be at the heart of this. Form of devolution. But that brings us right back to where I started, which is if we're now saying it's not all services for unemployed, but only but very restricted to those that are long term and over the year, yeah. it takes away from that flexibility, uh, cohesion, and ability to deal with the whole issue, both in terms of 
um, the overall structure of the nation, but also for the individual? My, I hesitate to say this given that you were one of the architects of, of the Smith report. Doesn't my, mean my, I agree with everything. Fair, fair enough. My, my <laughs> reading of um, Smith paragraphs 57 mm -hmm. is, is the intention was about taking over responsibility in mm -hmm. Scotland for those mandated programmes. Mm -hmm. Um, Scot Scottish organisations, local authorities indeed already run various uh, employment support, employability, back to work mm -hmm. schemes which uh, affect people before they get to that point of mandating. So um, this is a net step forward for Scotland. There are risks and jagged edges, some of which hopefully could be smoothed out, but there are opportunities for integration nonetheless which we haven't seen previously. Can I, can I just finish with one thing here? Okay. Can I just say their soundings off about I have signed off the Smith report? Yes, it was a negotiation. Can I say your representatives in the Labour group also signed it off? So please go back to them and ask them to join with me in getting this made better and back to the spirit of the Smith agreement. I'll follow up on something about, about the discussion relating to the work programme. I think it's important not to see the clause through the prism of the work programme. The employment programmes have changed like the sands of the desert, that um, we cannot expect that two years from now, five years from now, ten years from now, that there will be the same structure, the same management rules, the same processes as there are now. But what there is supposed to be is an enduring power for Scotland to make its own decisions in those areas, whatever the decisions may subsequently be. And uh, that means that we, we, we shouldn't get too bogged down um, with the actual structure. And what troubles me about the clause is that the clause is trying to do that. I think we've, I think we've got to... Just a local government. Well, I got you know, just in, you in terms of the complexities of this and the challenge in moving forward, there's been a lot of talk uh, you know, resulting from Smith and other. This is that, that, um, that the work programme could be devolved to a lower level of government, and you know, how, do, how does that play in uh, to, 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 to this discussion? I'll come back to what Paul said here. It's about giving Scotland the powers, and we need to then decide. How, how we use them, but if it's only wants to reflect on Duncan's point. Well, it, of course, this is about entirely about the powers of the Scottish Parliament. It's not about the powers of the UK Parliament, and they can claim at any point that they have concomitant powers, concurrent, that this is about shared competence, and there's nothing to stop them running parallel systems. I think we've seen that, for example, with the local support services framework, that they that the DWP is actively attempting to do that in certain areas which do overlap very substantially with the competences of the Scottish Parliament. Um, that needs to be also part of the intergovernmental dis um, agreement. But the question is, are, is Scotland to have any areas of exclusive competence? Well, that takes a, a completely different discussion, I think, Paul, but it's a, probably a good place to end with that big question mark hanging there. So, uh, um, in, in terms of the, we've covered um, quite a breadth of information today. We've got some, quite deep in some areas. So, I'm very grateful to the witnesses for coming along today and giving us of their expertise. It'll help us when we come to the, the end of our conclusions in the next month. Uh, so, thank you very much for attending today. Um, uh, that's the end of this particular session. Um, the next meeting will happen on the 26th of February when the committee will take evidence from a range of experts regarding borrowing powers. And I'm now moving this into private session. And so those who are not members of the committee or associated with it can we now please vacate um, the committee room. <laughs>